Good morning. Today we're in John chapter 1. We're going to be reading from the New King James Translation for the most part. And um, last time we finished at verse 25. And I'll pick up at verse 24 for a little bit of context and we'll read through verse 34 for our passage today. Verse 24. Now those who were sent from the fair... <laughs> I already messed up. That's good. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize you with water. But there stands one among you whom you don't know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me. Whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. Now these things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me because he was, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Awful cool, awfully cool set of verses. It's, it's so cool. Last week we saw how the priests and the Levites were persistent to find out who John the baptizer really was. And they'd exhausted all the possibilities that the Pharisees had likely suggested. Um, but they still wanted to find out who it was that, and, and why he was performing this ritual of baptism, immersion on the Jewish people. We discussed that formal baptism in that time uh, for, for the repentance of sin was something for those who were converting to Judaism. Uh, but the idea of baptizing again or in this situation was kind of new and different. They weren't quite sure what was going on. And I guess maybe the Pharisees thought that the Messiah or the prophet or Elijah would have the authority to, to do, develop new doctrines or to make changes in these things. And that's why they were asking. Now, as he answers their questions, we see that John is on a mission. In the first 18 verses of the Apostle John's preamble that we've studied, we've read four times that John the baptizer's purpose in life was to be a witness of Jesus Christ, also called the Word and also called the true light. Now, I love the way that John answers this, John the baptizer answers this, and he's a great example for all of us. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, terrific background information he can claim. You know, we, we went over those. This, he was the son of a man who was called a faithful, blameless priest, Zacharias, uh, who served in the temple. Does he give them those credentials? No. Does he tell them about the angel's prophecy that he would be born miraculously? No. Does he quote the words of the Holy Spirit given to, through Zacharias uh, about himself saying in Luke, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. I mean, that's what Zacharias said about John the baptizer. No, John doesn't claim that. He doesn't tell him all this stuff about himself and give him a whole list of credentials and have up on the wall you know, all of his certificates of authenticity and all of those things. No, he, he doesn't even tell him that the Most High... God came to him when he was out in the wilderness and told him to do all of this stuff. I would have think, you know, you and I, well, maybe, maybe not you, but me, I, I would have included at least one of those things to say, hey, look, you know, God sent me to do this, and so pay attention. But John was obviously more focused on the task at hand, on his mission in life, to be a witness of the Messiah that was to come. Even though this Messiah had not even be, been revealed yet to John, to be respectful, you know, to, to answer, who are you? He did include a phrase about himself, but then he immediately began to witness of Jesus. Now in the Amplified Translation, verses 26 and 27 say, John answered him 
answered them, I baptize only in water. But among you there stands one whom you do not know, whom you do not recognize, and of whom you know nothing. It is he, the preeminent one who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, even as his slave. So John still didn't know, at that point, didn't seem to know the identity of the Messiah, but he didn't hesitate to witness about him. Now, that took a lot of faith, he didn't. Uh, we know Jesus, and sometimes we're a little hesitant to, to witness for him. So it's a great example. And, and you notice he let the religious leaders know that the Messiah had not been revealed yet, but was indeed already among them, even though they didn't know who it was. And, and we're going to dig into some more details on this in a few moments, but John also revealed a bit of the Messiah's divinity as he spoke, both of his pre-existence, it is he, the preeminent one who comes after me, and his ultimate worthiness, infinitely higher than a man. Uh, it says, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie, even as a slave. And it was the lowest slave, you know, that, that took the shoes off and washed the feet. So he's like, you know, he is so much higher than I could ever, ever dream of. And so that sets the example for us. And so our first life, first life lesson today is that in witnessing, minimize yourself. Instead, focus on Jesus and his infinite goodness and authority. Minimize yourself and focus on Jesus and his infinite goodness and authority. Now, one thing that does stump me is that the religious leaders did not know that Jesus was the Messiah, even before he began his public ministry. You're saying, well, John hadn't pointed him out yet. No, John hadn't. But let's look. Uh, first thing, all the Jewish people had access through the teachers, you know, through their, the scribes and, and the various teachers, to the information in chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. And it was prophesied when the Messiah would be cut off or killed. So they knew when the Messiah was going to die or be cut off. They knew that the Messiah probably wouldn't be revealed until he was about 30 years old. And so they could do the math. They could have backed up and seen, hey, the Messiah should be around 30 years old at this time. And so that, that's the first thing. They should, so they knew when he was going to come. They should have known when he was going to come. And then the second thing is that all Jerusalem had heard 30 years earlier about the wise men coming to find where the king of the Jews, Jesus, was born. And so they knew where he was and when. And yes, once Herod found out that the Magi had kind of tricked him and didn't tell him where King Jesus was born at, he had all the little boys in and around Bethlehem slaughtered. So people could have just written it off as the Messiah, oh, well, the Messiah got killed by this evil king, and so he's not here. Or they could have realized that if they found somebody in Israel that was around 30 years old, that was born in Bethlehem, hey, something miraculously happened to keep this guy alive because the king ordered everybody killed. Uh, they, they slaughtered them all. And it, the slaughter, from what I understand, was, was a, something that was sudden and unannounced. I mean, they didn't, you know, proclaim... Next week at 2 o'clock on Thursday, we're going to kill all the kids. No, no, they, they go in there and slaughter them before they had a chance to know what was going on. A third thing that they could have, should have been able to see, in my opinion, is that the angels supernaturally appeared to a group of shepherds outside of Bethlehem and announced to them that the Messiah was born that very day and also told them how to find him. And we see that the shepherds didn't just sit there and say, oh, that's wonderful. No, they followed up. They went in. They visited the birthplace. They visited Jesus. They visited his parents. And they didn't just say, after that, that was a wonderful experience we had. <laughs> they began telling everybody they could. And that's what the Bible tells us. They told them what all the angels had told them and what they had found. So now pretty much all of Bethlehem knew where the Messiah was, where he was born, who he, who he was born to, and all of this had been verified by angels from heaven. Now, is that enough to know that this is probably the Messiah? <laughs> I would think so. Well, if that wasn't enough, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, when he was about 12 years old, excuse me, when he was eight days old, guess what? 
there were two people at the temple. One of them was Simeon. And let me, let me just read the scripture and tell you what, what happened. Simeon and Anna. So this is uh, verse 25. It says, uh, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. By the way, the Holy Spirit's really active a lot in all of these. Do you notice that? That's incredible. So and he came by the Holy Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, circumcision, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things that were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will, sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with the husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years old, who did not but depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So the Holy Spirit had told Simeon, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. Simeon sees the Messiah, blesses the Lord because of it, holds up the child in, in the process. Anna sees this happening. She goes out and she tells everybody that's interested in redemption in Jerusalem about what had happened. Okay? Do you think word would get around? I would think so. But, you know, two things to know. Of course, this was done in, in a, the, the temple, a public ceremony. So anybody could have he heard these words. But um, I, I think, you know, Anna was so cool. 84-year-old. She was praying day and night in the temple. She wasn't a crazy woman. <laughs> and she couldn't quit talking about the Messiah had come. Now, if that weren't enough, okay, the fifth thing, when Jesus was 12 years old, you know, people forget things over time. Uh, 30 years ago, I don't, I don't, where did I live 30 years ago? I guess I was in the same house I am now because my kids were born while I was there. So I can figure that out. <laughs> but... But when he was 12, 12 years had passed, and um, when he was 12 years old, he went to the temple for the Passover feast, and Jesus got so involved in the work of his father God that his par when his parents left to go back home with their entourage and all the family, um, he was sitting there talking to the teachers. In Luke 2, 46 to 47, he says, Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. That's pretty amazing. I mean, this is the people in the temple. And he's asking them questions, but obviously he was giving them more understanding and answers than they even knew about. Now, I can understand John not seeing all this. I mean, John was born at a different time. He wasn't there at the baptism. I mean, at the... Um, um, you know, when the shepherds came in, uh, he wasn't there when Simeon uh, uh, was, was involved in circumcision of Jesus. John wasn't there apparently in the temple when Jesus was talking to the leaders and teaching them about God. Um, so I can say, and he was out in the desert most of his life, apparently. But with all this evidence and more, honestly, I can't see how the, how the religious teachers want to know. And this I haven't worked through. Maybe y'all have some wisdom on this, but I don't know if the truth was being suppressed. It's like, oh, let's ignore that because we're in power. Or if it just simply ignored. They just didn't pay attention to it. I, I don't know. But all of that is about to come to an end. Now, God told 
Israel, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the religious leaders, a lot of things. And they didn't pay attention. Our life lesson for us today is when God keeps telling you something over and over, pay attention and act on it. When God keeps telling you something over and over, pay attention and act on it. So let's look at verse 29 in our scriptures. John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So now John has finally discovered that Messiah. He calls him the Lamb of God. Uh, why would he call Jesus a lamb? I mean, this is a person. This is a 30-year-old man. <laughs> Look, there's a lamb. No, no, John, that's a man. No, that's the Lamb of God. Let's look back to where God provided another lamb. We read in Genesis 22 that Abraham's commitment to God was tested as God told him to go and offer his only son, Isaac, as a burnt sacrifice on the, mount, on the mountains of Moriah. Um, you know where the mountains of Moriah are at? Jerusalem. As they were going on the final segment of the journey, getting ready to, to go up and make the sacrifice, Isaac made an amazing discovery. He says in Genesis uh, 22, 7 and 8, And Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here, I'm a, here I am, my son. Then he said, Behold, or look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So the both of them went together. We see here the very first time in Scripture that a lamb is mentioned as a sacrifice. Although burnt offerings have been made since the time of Noah, this is the first time a, specifically, a lamb was specifically mentioned. But lambs were sacrificed from then, maybe be probably before them, and, and on many, many times. And, and the idea of a lamb being sacrificed for sin became pretty much a standard way that Jews considered many of their sins to be covered. Looking back, we see parallels between Isaac and Jesus. Both Isaac and Jesus were promised sons. Both had miraculous conceptions. Both were the only sons of their fathers. And if you say, hey, what about Ishmael? I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> Both ascended Mount Moriah for a sacrifice to be made. And notice the words in verse 8 where Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. At the time, he knew that God had been the one that provided Isaac, though he thought that lamb, Isaac, would be sacrificed. Abraham's words were also prophetic, as we see that John the baptizer here was identifying Jesus as the Lamb of God that would be sacrificed for sin, that God had provided himself, capital H if you want to look at it in the proper grammar in English, God had provided himself to be the lamb. As we know, um, in the scripture with Abraham and Isaac, Isaac's life was spared, but God did indeed provide an alternate sacrifice for him, but Jesus would not be spared in the same way Isaac was, because Jesus would be the alternate sacrifice for our sins. Isaiah 53 tells us, surely, verse 4 to, se four to 7, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed, him, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This description of Jesus is accurate in so many ways, but let's look specifically at the forgiveness of sins. Lambs were very much associated with being slain for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, so much so that uh, even Josephus, uh, a, the secular uh, historian, uh, wrote in the Wars of the Jews, or the Jewish Wars, depends on the translation you use, uh, book 6 and in, in uh, the passage 424, he notes that on just one Passover, when Jerusalem was under siege uh, by Titus, 
said it was found that the number of sacrifices was 256,500. Over a quarter million lambs were slain on that last Passover in that, in that temple. Now, those were the lambs from the people that they had brought in. These were lambs of the people, the best lambs they had according to Exodus 12, 5. Your lamb should be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. But John the baptizer was proclaiming that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So it's clear to us now that he's saying that Jesus would die for our sins. This was the first day of Jesus' public ministry. And you know, later on the disciples didn't know what he was talking about when he said he was gonna die, <laughs> right? They, people wanna see what they wanna see. We need to listen to what the word of God says rather than ignoring the parts we don't like and only taking the parts that we do like. So we see from the very beginning um, that Jesus was set to die. We'd already read, uh, we studied uh, a week or two ago, some other phrases that were, were given by Jesus where the, the disciples were astonished. Oh no, you're not gonna die. We don't want you to die. But we know that was, that was to be the case. So let's, let's take a look at what's unique about this Lamb of God rather than a lamb from a man. In Hebrews 10, 1. This is, I'm going to read verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 10 in Hebrews 10. It kind of gives an overview of this. It says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of things to come, not the good things themselves. Excuse me, a dim preview of good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Verse 10, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So we see a, for, for us, how it applies to us here, our life lesson is that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, provides cleansing and forgiveness for our sin. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, provides cleansing and forgiveness for our sin. I'm going to go back to John 1, verse 30 and 31. We see that, that uh, John confirms that Jesus is indeed not only the one that he had been proclaiming would be coming, but also the one that was promised to Israel throughout the prophets in the Old Testament. Verse 30 this is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. Now, something else caught my attention in there. We see where John says, I did not know him. Now, as we speak in English, uh, think about different ways that you can know somebody. There's a lot, several different ways. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary gives several, um, several definitions relating to knowing a person. Uh, one is to have a direct cognition of somebody. So you'd say, uh, oh, Bill Gates, I know him. Well, I've heard of him. Uh, another is to have an understanding. You know, oh, you don't know my wife, but I do. Another one, a uh, third definition is to recognize the nature of or discernment about someone. Um, I know what people like Fred are capable of doing. I kind of know what their nature is. A fourth definition is to recognize as being the same as someone previously known. Like saying, yes, I've seen her before. I don't know who she is, but I know her from seeing her. Uh, a fifth one is to be acquainted or familiar with somebody. Oh, I know Susan. She's the lady that runs the activities here, isn't she? Y'all know Susan? <laughs> and then the, the sixth one is to have experience with someone. 
And as, of course I know Jim. He's my best friend. You know, each one of these have different nuances and are, and are different. And so why all of these nuances? Well, in the Greek word that was used in this verse, it's the same way as it is in English. There's a number of different ways. And John wasn't saying that he had never heard of Jesus. Um, he may have played with them as a child. I don't know, maybe when they were coming back from Jerusalem and Jesus was in the temple, uh, when, when Jesus was 12 years old, John might have been part of that family group that was going back home and left Jesus there without noticing he was gone. Um, he may have heard Elizabeth and, um, and Zacharias talking about Jesus when he was a child. Maybe talking about his brothers and his sisters and his mom and dad. Um, he may have even seen Jesus recently in the crowd. Oh, I, yeah, I recognize. I've, I've seen that face before. I, I, I know him. But that's not what John was saying or meaning by knowing him. He was saying that he didn't realize that Jesus, at that mo up until that moment, that Jesus was the one that was the Messiah. He didn't know until that moment in time when Jesus walked up to him, and we see in Matthew uh, 3, 13, um, he had this epiphany, epiphany, this uh, aha moment, the moment in time when the light flipped on in his heart and soul, and he knew that everything was about to change forever. You all ever have those moments in your life and your, in time? I hope so. That's what God does for us. We read in Matthew 3, 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now, I think at that moment, the Holy Spirit was so strong in John that John knew exactly was a, what was about to happen. Because in the very next verse, verse 14, And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Basically to accept the example. And then he allowed him. John knew the Messiah was coming. He knew people needed to prepare their hearts and be publicly baptized to tell the world they were ready to receive the Messiah. He'd already taken heat from the religious authorities about why he was baptizing people and, and who he was. And he'd given them the answers that God had given him. John had likely waited his whole life for these moments that we're reading about in Scripture here. And again, John probably knew who Jesus was as an old playmate or family member or an onlooker in the crowd, but may have recognized his face. But now it's like having never known a thing about him. Now, suddenly, there he is, God's promised Messiah, standing in front of him, asking to be baptized, feeling as, worthy, un, as unworthy as a flea on a dog's tail. But Jesus was asked, Jesus asked John to do this, and he did. And then John gives us this testimony of what happened next uh, in John 1, verse 32 through verse 34. He says, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is the son of God. Awesome, awesome verses. What a great time. Our life lesson is that you can know, really know beyond a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who takes away your sin and will change your life completely. You can know, really know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who takes away all of your sin and will change your life completely. Brothers and sisters, I can guess, I don't know exactly where you are in, in your relationship to God, but uh, I want to encourage you to get to know Jesus more. We know about him. We know who he is. We may have seen pieces of what he's done. But please, I want to get you, encourage you to get to know him closer and closer. We have different levels. Like, like probably John knew Jesus in different ways. There's always more to know about Jesus. And I want to encourage you to do that. You know, Jesus said in Revelation 3, 20 to 21, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Now, you know, I, I feel knocking at my door too. You feel knocking at your door. 
Sometimes there's something holding us back from opening up and saying, Lord, take this part of my life. Lord, come in fellowship with me in, in this part. And um, if, if there's something kind of holding you back from that, I, I, I'll tell you what it is. It's what that Lamb of God came to overcome, to wipe away, to wash away, that is sin. There's something standing between you. And so just take a few minutes, consider the words of God. If you're not right, if you're not in total fellowship with God, you've come to the right place. Church is an awesome place. Um, a few years ago, I, I was in a crusade meeting and there was a, a man that was running the sound in a total, totally secular venue, but um, he, he had never come across a, a presentation of the gospel before. And he, he just asked, you know, why are you going out and inviting people off the streets? It was in Miami, Florida. Why are you off inviting all these odd people off the streets in Miami Beach, Florida to come in here to a religious meeting? And uh, he just told him, he said, well, you know, it's not, you know, if you're sick, <laughs> if you're needing to be forgiven, if you're needing to get right with God, or if you, if you, let me back up. If you're sick, you don't go and just stay out where you're at, you go to a hospital. So this is kind of like a hospital for people who are sick of sin and they can come in here and have that, that sin wiped out and forgiven. Well, there were three nights in that meeting and I'm, uh, I'm glad to tell you the third night, that man running the sound and light systems there came back to the, the same person who had told him that and said, I'm ready to check into that hospital. He realized his need and uh, to ask for his sins to be forgiven. Sometimes it's attitudes and actions which are displeasing to God. Uh, or maybe there's something that's hampering our plans or hampering his plans in our life. We have our own plans. But I do encourage you to claim God's promise for your life. Confess those sins. Confess those shortcomings to God. And in your heart, just ask him to take that away from you. To take those shortcomings away. Forgive your sins. Fill you with, you, with his Holy Spirit. You know, John was filled with the Holy Spirit and that same Holy Spirit is with us today and he can help us and he can show us how to bring righteousness into our lives from God, not our own. You pray a simple prayer for in your hearts, turning away from sin and I pray that you do that and, and as you do, the Bible's promises are open to you. I encourage you to dig into his word every day. Keep an open line of communication from you to God on consistently. He does want to hear from you keep in fellowship with uh, others that believe the Bible and are following the Bible, uh, plug in and, and take action on what the Bible teaches. And uh, I appreciate every one of you being here today. And it wraps up this section. We're about uh, out of time, but we'll see you next week, picking up in verse 35. And if there's anything that you'd like for us to pray with you to see me or Mitzi afterwards or some of the other brothers and sisters here, and uh, I'm sure they'd love to pray for you. Let me give you a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.